Good morning. Today is Friday, February 10th. Three. Uh, this is the morning meeting of the Natural Resources and Energy Committee. We are continuing our work on S5, the Affordable Heat Act, and we are uh, in that process. We've moved on to a bill markup <clears throat> for people uh, who are following progress from outside the building. So we are going to be editing uh, ongoing on a yearly basis for the next week. The goal is to have this bill out within a week. And we'll be going through drafts probably each day um, and taking additional testimony as needed to verify the, the, the uh, things that are as yet to be determined up and resolved. So, with that, I'll we'll turn it over to council. And if you could introduce the draft that we should all be following, um, and then we just double check. Ms. Newman, is this draft on our website? Just about to go. Okay, so it'll be posted momentarily on the website. People will be able to get it. Um, and if you could introduce it and then start us off again, please. Sure. Good morning. Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. <clears throat> uh, today we're on draft 2.1 of the Strike All Amendment to S5. Uh, it's dated 2-9-1-3. This draft reflects the work that you did yesterday. Um, it has a few small pieces of highlighting, which were things that you left as unresolved, as well as the handful of small changes you requested. Um, but then the rest of it is not highlighted. So uh, I think what we're going to do is do a all, nearly line by line walker from the beginning. Uh, yes. And okay. so th I th so we've, uh, many of us have been thinking about places that we'd like to make changes or clarify or ask questions so slow it out to begin so as part of going through this time um, if you have edits you'd like to offer we can consider them and maybe we're adding them or if we don't quite get that far at least we'll be flagging something where you say okay well i want to work on this some more um and one of the other things that um any member of the committee might could do is before we're back at the table again like this, if you want to work with council and say, uh, can we draft some link? Can we redraft, you know, A sub four? And that way we'll have language and progress that we can look at and, and sort that out too. Okay. So with that, let's let's um, start at the beginning. Thank you. Okay, so on page one, section one is the short title. This act shall be known and may be cited as the Affordable Heat Act. Section two is the finding section. Uh, these findings, I can walk through them, but these are the findings from H715 from last year and the one edition of number six that you discussed yesterday. Do you want me to walk through the findings? Probably good to go there. Thank you. Unless anyone, so I may, as uh, I'm going to try to help with moving along, and I may say that, but don't be shy about interrupting and saying, oh, actually, I do have a question. So, one of my jobs is to help moving, but I don't want to ever not pause when you have something on your mind. All right, so let's jump to page three, section three which is the statutory provisions that establish the Clean Heat Standards Program in statute being added to Title 30 as a new chapter, Chapter 94. So the first section in the Clean Heat Standards Chapter is the intent section, and it reads, pursuant to 2 VSA 205A, it is the intent of the General Assembly that the Clean Heat Standard be designed and implemented in a manner that achieves Vermont's thermal sector greenhouse gas emissions reduction <clears throat> necessary to meet the requirements of 10 VSA 578A2 and 3, minimizes costs to customers, and recognizes that affordable heating is essential for Vermonters. It shall minimize adverse impacts to customers, low income and moderate income, and those households with the highest energy burdens. So this section was added to clarify what the intent of this, um, with the, of these provisions are in this statute, 
and uh, specifically to be used by LCAR uh, and anyone else looking to figure out the legislative intent for um, the rules that will be adopted as part of this program. The adverse uh, impacts that we want to minimize, does that, can that be read as anticipating that the bill itself will have adverse impacts? And we want to minimize those or should we be clear that we're talking about the adverse impacts of fuel costs? The adverse impacts of, uh, of fossil fuels. Which is my understanding, but that's the intent of that sentence. Right? So, thanks. I had a discussion with council about this, uh, it seems like months ago, maybe, and the whole thing, like, I think um, the intent is, in my mind, to avoid having it read as so we're anticipating adverse impacts. And we want the bill to minimize the anticipated adverse impacts. So maybe we need a little wordsmithing to. Are we are we anticipating adverse impacts, or are we? Well, I think that the current system has adverse impacts, and that's the adverse impacts we want to minimize. I think we we want. First of all, I, I, I'm reading this sort of as a language pain in the neck, but also politically. Every word we put down, we should presume there are people who are going to maliciously misread it. They're going to take it and make it meaning that you'll see it on the internet. They're going to make it mean what it doesn't mean. It happens all the time. Just turn on Fox News. Okay. Um, so, rather, unless you have sort of words at hand, I would so my suggestion will be. Flag it and talk okay. about. Yeah, that's what I was suggesting. Might express it differently. That we flag it. I don't know, counselor, if you have anything, or I'm not asking you to compose in the flag, although sometimes you do. I. So first, I'm slightly unrelated. I think it would be it is important for you all to consider how Elcar will read this, in addition to what Senator McCormick just said, but how Elcar will read this, and how this will help them. And so I do think you, there is lots of room to be more specific. So you can definitely change this language. I will need more specific information. Okay. So yeah, so you can think about what your intent yeah. is, but. I yeah. think at this point, we'll drive this one to red flag. No, okay. Not even a red flag. Yeah, it's flag. always bothered me because it, there's a presumption or it could be read that there's a presumption that there'll be an adverse impact to operating the programs um, and that we're going to minimize those, which has always seems to come at it in a repeating way. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I just so the next section is section 8122. It starts on line 12 of page three. This is the clean heat standard. The clean heat standard is established under this program. Obligated parties shall reduce greenhouse gas emissions attributable to the Vermont thermal sector by retiring required amounts of clean heat credits to meet the thermal sector portion of the greenhouse gas emission reductions under the Global Warming Solutions Act. By rule or order, the Commission shall establish or adopt a system of tradable clean heat credits earned from the delivery of clean heat measures that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and just, I'll take a step back for a second. So this first section, 8122, lays out the major elements of the program, which are then discussed in detail in the subsequent sections. So on to page four. An obligated party may obtain the required amount of clean heat credits through delivery of eligible clean heat measures, through contracts for delivery of eligible clean heat measures, through the market purchase of clean heat credits, or through delivery of eligible clean heat measures by a designated statewide default delivery agent. Can, yes. Sorry, can, I, can I jump in here? So I'm just catching up. Bottom of page three, line 19, tradable clean heat credits. 
So there's been some discussion about uh, tradability of these things. Is there going to be like a, a, a freestanding market that's managed through the PC, or if we're shifting more over to a model of uh, the the, uh, the statewide entity that default delivery agent? Uh, if that's where the obligation by default goes to, do we end up with a freestanding tradable system? It could be that credits are handled either by just going to the default delivery agent or by an obligated party going to the PC directly and saying, we have our own program that's going to meet our obligation, which suggests that there's not sort of a third freestanding market. And so I just fight more to tradable. Because I don't know if we're going to end up with a formal trading system. It's when we establish the system. But it's, yeah, and it could be that that they that credits can move around, but maybe there it's not "quote unquote" trading. So I guess I'm just going to no. flag that for to keep an eye on. Okay. Also, do you have something you want to say about that? Yeah. Okay. So, mm -hmm. Sarah, Back to the slide 18, by rule or order may establish or adopt. They can establish it by rule, the rule procedure, or could they just do by order? What we're allowing them to do uh, either way um, but there is council can help me uh, i'm waiting to see you're about to all the public hearings that have to take place right or it's by rule or order sure and i would just add that um as i think i mentioned yesterday i think that there are multiple components of this and in some way if there's going to be a sort of tradable system, the credits in themselves are sort of standalone in that there's going to need to be a lot of um, elements to just creating credits separate from the rest of the elements of the clean heat program. So it seemed that this could be something they could do. They may need to start immediately um, because of the early action credits. Um, but that is, uh, you can specify your intent on that. Um, and so we have the PUC. I mean, so the PUC continues to work on the language. I think what they're focused on is delivering the program that we're talking about here and the policy that we're talking about here. But they're also trying to make it um, as administratively efficient as they can. Without, without just saying, oh, everything's going to be by order, you know, don't think twice. Um, so they are scheduled to be in on Tuesday to present the language that they're working on the same sections that we're coming into right now. And on the, the part that you were just mentioning, the part where we talk about what does the pre-filing hearings look like, who's brought it in, how do we address equity, all that stuff. So it's good for us to read through, but we will see new language from that Tuesday. So what does that mean? Yeah, please. Just uh, when Act 60 passed, it could go there often. Uh, the bill passed uh, in June. And that June, there was a committee established to make technical corrections to the law that was just passed. Uh -huh. um, to make recommendations for technical corrections for the legislature for the next year or two years. And it, it held, you know, it dealt with local or pretty schools and you know, how tax rates were, um, would be decided at what time of the year and to work out logistical kind of things. And that came to the legislature pretty much passed. Um, so that's the, do we, is there a, I, I don't know, I'm going to call that a that's an acknowledgement that in the course of putting these things together and taking public hearings, there'll be a general consensus that there should be a change here, there, in the next place. Is this a 
provide an avenue for that that suggests to people that this has been written in stone and that there's you know, a look back that's it's uh, not a uh, yeah. Is it a look back or is it technical corrections or is it so the bumps out? Yeah. So are you suggesting that we might want to consider at creating yeah. uh, like a whatever this yeah, probably don't want to create it in the next three minutes. Exactly. Right. We have to keep that in mind as we look at the rest of the building. There might be some there might, there might be a calming effect of well, I, yeah. Lose the parts of the building, scratch their head. Okay. There's a lot of um, information coming back to us each year, and we have the 20. We're not disagreeing in any way. We have the 24 and 25 sessions, state engagement with TC, and all these sessions. But it does mean for us that it's episodic. You know, we're, we're here for part of the year, and then we're gone. So there's like eight months in which we're really not tuned in, and maybe a um, standing working group that stays a little bit you know, more engaged is a good idea. Give us a running start every time we came back as opposed to spinning at the end of the scratch. I was just saying, uh, thank you, Chairman Bray. I was just going to say that I feel comfortable with the current setup we have, just knowing that we're, we've requested multiple reports and we do have an opportunity during the legislative session to address things. Um, so I'm feeling pretty comfortable with the process. Well, we look at the reassurance because you're yeah. right. you'll so, elbow me when we get one of those things that gives you the, the screams comfort. I will. I will. Thank you. I'll softly comfort you with comfort. <laughs> okay. All right. So back to top stage four. On page four, line six. Subsection D, uh, the highlighted numbers and letters here are that are to reflect that I broke up this paragraph based on yesterday's conversation. So it now reads, the commission shall adopt rules and may issue orders to implement and enforce the Clean Heat Standard Program. The requirement to adopt rules does not in any way impair the commission's authority. To issue no, orders. I, I know the last one that was, I turned it off. No, I, I think I'm around this time. Or I turned take it any other so. actions. <laughs> Sorry, I was responding to the chair's comment. <laughs> Both before and after final rules take effect to implement and enforce the clean heat standard. The commission's rules may include a provision that allows the commission to revise its clean heat standard rules by order of the commission without the revisions being subject to the rulemaking requirements of 3 BSA chapter 25. Provided that the commission provides notice of any proposed changes, allows for a 30 day comment period, and responds to all comments received on the proposed change. Any orders issued under this chapter shall be subject to appeal to the Vermont Supreme Court under uh, Section 12 of this title, and the Commission must immediately file any orders and a red line and a clean version of the revised rule with the Secretary of State with notice simultaneously provided to the House Committee on Environment and Energy and the Senate Committees on Finance and on Natural Resources and Energy. Um. Reorganizing. Right. So this is this the language itself hasn't changed. Um, everything that's in subsections two through four were the language yesterday that was proposed by the PUC. Questions here. Okay, so on page five, Thank you. the definition section, A123, as used in this chapter, carbon intensity value means the amount of life cycle greenhouse gas emissions per unit of energy of fuel expressed in grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per megajoule. 
clean heat credit means a tradable non-tangible commodity that represents the amount of greenhouse gas reduction attributable to a clean heat measure. The commission shall establish a system of management for clean heat credits pursuant to this chapter. So I'm flagging that one just to make sure that if we massage the treatability language that we have that one, we know that that one needs to be picked up. Clean heat measure means fuel delivered and technologies installed to end use customers in Vermont that reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the thermal sector. Clean heat measures shall not include switching from one fossil fuel use to another fossil fuel use. The commission may adopt a list of acceptable actions that qualify as clean heat measures. Commission means the Public Utility Commission. Default delivery agent means the entity designated by the commission to provide services that generate clean heat measures. Page six, energy burden means the annual spending on thermal energy as a percentage of household income. Entity means any individual, trustee, agency, partnership, association, corporation, company, municipality, political subdivision, or any other form of organization. Um, can you remind me again, what is a political subdivision? Um, it can be a municipality uh -huh. or any- Water of, district, fire district? Yes, but I think that falls district. under that, yes. Police district, yeah. but the, so not to be fiddly, but right before I used to live municipality. So I was thinking of school districts and water districts and communication union districts, they're all municipalities. So we also have counties. Uh -huh. uh, okay, just wondering what I, I mean, wasn't remembering because I figured the words are there for a reason. Thank you. I think it was a standard definition that I took from another chapter. If yeah. you would like to modify it, you can. Well, thanks. I just okay. wanted to know what each word meant. Because... Fuel pathway means a detailed description of all stages of fuel production and use for any particular fuel, including feedstock generation, for extraction, production, transportation, distribution, and, co and combustion of the fuel by the consumer. The fuel pathway is used in the calculation of the carbon intensity value and life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of each fuel. Heating fuel means fossil-based heating fuel, including oil, propane, natural gas, coal, and kerosene. Obligated party means. Mr. Mr. Chair, sure. yeah. my apologies. No, it's not my, sorry. It's just, you. Uh, Samuel, no, I, I'm just wondering about 30 seconds. Great. So, when we say fuel pathway, um, we had a lot of discussion about fossil fuels that we put into the pool, suggested to legislation that they be evaluated by independent parties under a certain criteria. And there are folks that continue to tell us not to approve um, biofuels. And basically, what I've just described is are the issues surrounding a fuel pathway. Is that correct? Um, I am not comfortable caring. I don't. I didn't hear a lot of your testimony, so I don't know what so they were. The words that I just uttered about whether or not we should do biofuels and how they should be measured, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is the way in which fuel. This is a fuel pathway that will be. Regulated um, as set forth here. Yes. Biofuels is a fuel pathway. That's what we're talking about. Every biofuel, who, their its fuel pathway will be evaluated, and there are many. So when pathways. we set up criteria to, that we show that the bill were to, to delegate to some entity um, to measure how much fossil fuel was used to create the biofuel that's 
we're talking about biofuel pathways. Yes. I well, if it's not, then what is what are pathways? Yes, it includes all of the aspects to use to create that fuel. Yeah, so it would include fossil fuels use too. It will then be used in the life cycle analysis to calculate the greenhouse gas. So if someone calls us up and says, don't allow any biofuels, they're terrible, we, we would go back to this section of law and say whether or not this biofuel is more terrible than that one and this one is benign. That's we'll be, gonna, that, they will be evaluated using this. You. Yes. Just as a follow-up to that, so When we say fuel pathway, fuel means all kinds of fuel, whereas heating fuel, number nine, is just fossil-based. So, so just saying fuel pathway refers to more than just heating fuel in this context. Yes. I just want to make sure that that is. Each fuel has its own unique right. pathway. Whether it's fossil fuel or biogenic, yes. that is a that's a fuel and not strictly heat like even though biogenic fuels could be considered in some way heating fuels we are defining heating fuels as just the possible yes okay and i i'm, I'm going to just like make a flag of that in my head yeah. to make sure that as we use the word heating fuel throughout that we do just mean the fossil based ones and not all possible fuels for heating. Does that make sense? Yes, I was just writing. It. Yes, yes. Uh, internal consistency is important. We have to buy three definition. How do these pistachio nutshells get evaluated as heating source? Well, we would look at their generation and transportation and delivery. Each one is and if they were in fact, and we in fact have a plan, if said if, to look at even the forest impacts separately from this. Right. So thank you. That's just what I was going to say. That that last sentence, you know, brings it all back down to like what, why are we talking about it? It's because we come up with this carbon intensity value and a life cycle greenhouse gas emission. So if that's how we define the metric. And then later on, as Senator White was just saying, we also we ask the group to the tag to look more broadly than sort of second order effects like did crop fuel crop land get converted to biofuel properly? And was there unintended consequence that we're concerned about or it's a problem? Okay. Obligated party. Obligated party down on line 13 means a regulated natural gas utility serving customers in Vermont or for other heating fuels, the entity that makes the first sale of heating fuel into or in the state for consumption within the state. Yes, can I just ask a quick question? Is this a revised definition based on our recent work? Of just no. tuning that definition. Okay. Yeah. So that, this is a one to flag for me. So Senator wants Well, to... if there's new language coming, I just I may defer this, but I would look just for clear in, in the current language, like see clarity that it uh, would say um, for sale of the, the heating fuel into or for sale in state uh, state for consumption. To clarify that it's not just anybody who sells fuel in the state of the first sale in. No. And so, who would that be capturing? It would be excluding secondary sellers. So, because the way I read this right now, uh, uh, maybe this is not how legal grammar works, but of the first sale into is one group, or kind of acting like an and, of, or 
um, or in the state for consumption. For sale. <coughs> well, maybe it is clear. So, for, so I am happy to keep talking about this. Yeah. Me, I think it is important for you all to be clear in which level of distribution you are tending to capture with this definition. Can I? Get the whiteboard. So uh, let me just say for myself what I think the design is aiming for, and then we can sort out whether it's what we all thought. So the, the goal was the obligated party is the most likely the wholesaler that's selling into. So here's here's the state of Vermont. The little hard to follow it. W is wholesale. So they're selling to a retailer. Uh, they become the obligated, the red stars, they're the obligated party. The, uh, too many things going on. We have a, a wholesaler in Vermont. Uh, the question is if that wholesaler in Vermont has the, brought the, uh, they've purchased from another wholesaler, that's going to be the first sale into Vermont. Correct. So the wholesaler that buys from out of state, well, this is the, the one wrinkle I want to make sure we have really clear. If I'm a Vermont wholesaler, I go out of state to Albany to buy fuel. And I was thinking that our design is that whoever I'm buying from in Albany has the obligation uh, for that fuel sold because I'm a whole, even though I'm a wholesaler, to sort out the consumption piece. The wholesale of Albany is selling to a wholesale of Vermont. The obligated party is as described by the current language. I'm sorry, you have to say it again. I was okay. distracted. So, yes, so the first sale into or in the state. So, if the wholesaler is the first sale into the state for consumption of the state obligated. Um, and the for consumption, does that differentiate between I'm a Vermont based wholesaler now receiving fuels, uh, but I'm gonna sell onto a retailer. Is that phrase for consumption mean that uh, I'm not actually a consuming party, I'm just wholesaling. I'm uh, a depot for fuel. I'm trying to make sure I understand what the phrase for consumption applies to. So you've lost me again. I would propose, I think that uh, for consumption modifies both phrases okay. and that can be more clear. I can add it to both phrases if that would help. Okay. So it would, as I understand it, because because I wrote it, the first sale of heating fuel into the state for consumption in the state, or the first sale in the state for consumption in the state. So okay, that, that's clear to yeah. me. That's yeah, that's what I was suggesting. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I think yes. Yeah. But there are two different things. They are. There are two different yeah. things. But it is. But they're. Oh, sorry. Both places that fuel gets yeah. into the same. Okay, because that's like where the transaction occurs. Now, there are there could potentially be an entirely different set of language to use. Uh, so we can draft different language to be more precise using different words. Right. So because this is a potentially wrap around the axle thing, I would say why don't we flag it, come back, and I think for any other proposal of how we might express it, let's um, get it written down, whether it's and probably anyone who wants to work on that like should work with council who will keep us uh, help us keep it clear and then we can lay things side by side. If we want to tune something, uh, for me it would be easier to see version A and version B and say, oh, I'm 
we get it and we're picking up B or okay. A. Before you do that, I would yeah. like a very clear statement of the level of the distribution you are intending to capture with this definition. So, and then I can make it into legal words. Okay. <laughs> but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So I think what I heard you just say was a wholesaler that sells to a retailer who then sells to a customer, the wholesaler. That's yes. The last wholesaler who sells to a retailer. Yes. We're dealing with two different lines here. Because I still don't know where. Eating fuel is and what is not eating fuel, what is definition? Or would you say eating fuel? Yeah, no, not, the, not as defined for the bill in lines 11 and 12. Well, hopefully, sure. So, yeah, heating fuel is I was defined. Looking line six. Look at line 11 on page six. That's where we define what a heating fuel is. So right here. I'll, 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 I don't want to take okay, I, think old, I think you might be on the old. I think you might be on the old one. That's yeah. Yeah, OK. That's, 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 that's there you go. Okay. Yeah, we get into that. Keeping simultaneously reading and holding in draft mode. That's okay. I was like, that's yeah. yeah. And so, heating fuel for the purposes of being obligated is limited to fossil based fuel. Within the that's what the a term, it's a term of, I don't know, term of art within this bill. Right. This, this bill is using a lot of defined terms in a specific way relative to how this program will work. And I think you correctly stated the, the, the intent in terms of design of who becomes an obligated party. Right, and so last year when this was, when the obligated party language was being worked on, there was an attempt not to use wholesaler or distributor or retailer because those terms are not defined and I think are used differently by different um segments of industry and so however if that would help i could potentially craft language trying to use some of those language like sale to retail customer or sale to end use customer uh, you know i i don't know what other people think i think if we slow down and get our definition clear and then we're clear about it precisely i mean i think it has to be read in sort of a precise way. For instance, that phrase for consumption, my understanding is the reason that's in there is because some fuel will just pass through for month. Yes. So it gets, you know, it, one way I might think of it in my head is for fuels consumed in Vermont, then the rest of it happens. You know, like, so I'm going to exclude in my mind all the things that are just passing through. And I think it gets. So different people get off track or confused, I think, in different places, but like we're clear on the intent. It's at the wholesale level prior to that retail transaction. That sounds like what we were, we've been talking about. I, mean, I believe that's what we've been talking about for uh, a while. Okay. So if you want to lay, I'm putting a flag in this one. Take a critical, a critical definition. Thank you. So um, the last definition here is thermal sector has the same meaning as the residential, commercial, and industrial fuel use sector as used in the Vermont greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast. Can you unpack that one a little bit? What is not in if is there something that we're excluding that someone might say, oh, you might think that's thermal, but actually in this definition, that is not. Uh, not right now. I will have to go back to my notes. I haven't looked at the greenhouse gas inventory definition in a while. Okay, thank you.
So the next section is 8124, clean heat standard compliance, required amounts. Top of page seven. The commission shall establish the number of clean heat credits in each obligated part, each that each obligated party is required to retire each calendar year. The size of the annual requirement shall be set at a pace sufficient for Vermont's thermal sector to achieve life cycle carbon dioxide equivalent emission reductions consistent with the requirements of 10 BSA 578 A 2 and 3 expressed as life cycle greenhouse gas emissions pursuant to subsection 8125F of this title. So the commission is going to establish the number of clean heat credits that each party will need to have each year. Uh, the commission is going to set that number of credits based on a, a pace sufficient to meet the Global Warming Solution Act requirements of 40% emissions reduction by 2030 and 80% by 2050. Any questions? Okay. Annual requirements shall be expressed as a percent of each obligated party's contribution to the thermal sector's life cycle greenhouse gas, life cycle CO2e emissions in the previous year. The annual percentages shall be the same for all obligated parties. To ensure understanding among obligated parties, the commission shall publicly provide a description of the annual requirements in plain terms. To support the ability of the obligated parties to plan for the future, the commission shall establish and update annual clean heat credit requirements for the next 10 years. Every three years, the commission shall extend the requirements three years, shall assess emission reductions actually achieved in the thermal sector, and if necessary, Revise the pace of clean heat credit requirements for future years to ensure that the thermal sector portion of the emission reduction requirements for 2030 and 2050 will be achieved. So 10 years worth of requirements should be available at any time. So um, obligated parties have the ability to plan in advance. Page eight. Um, any questions before we go on? Yeah. The, um, the question of whether or not various uh, credits are on pace to meet the uh, requirements of the law. How, how are we measuring that? So it's not if the credits are on, if the, if the, if we are doing sufficient work, sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. If the requirements that have been set are achieving the emissions reductions yeah. they were uh, intended to achieve. So there is provision later for the Department of Public Service specifically to be doing auditing and verification of clean heat measures to see if they are resulting in the um, estimated emissions reductions. But the determination that we're on pace is actually made in anticipation of these things actually happening. We're going to do blah, blah, blah. Okay, get your credits. Or does the credits come after the savings have actually been realized? No, this, the credit is issued upon the installation of the measure, which is technically before emissions reductions would have been, would have occurred. Do we have criteria for telling them how they measure that or yes. we're just trusting them that they're going to figure it out? No. So it does, there is the section on verification of clean heat measures after the fact is um, not as, is not very detailed. I don't know if there's specific criteria. So we're handing that off to the PUC. To um, the PUC, in, uh, that's one of the specific tasks though for the Department of Public Service. 
So by, I think it's analogous as a tier three when uh, utilities take a measure to satisfy their tier three obligation. They had to figure out, well, to what degree are they uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by helping a customer with it? They changed. And the, uh, there's a technical advisory group that had to figure out rather than go out and audit every home that had a tier three measure installed and do a before and after, they studied enough of them, they sampled enough of them to say, okay, on average, if you install a cold kind of heat pump, you'll reduce emissions by X. And so, the, but they went through a formal evaluation process to come up with whatever X was to assign a value to each measure. I think that's, we're anticipating the same thing will happen with this group as all the measures are going to have to get evaluated and assign sort of an impact score and you know, how much you're using. And then that feeds back to the system. And then we measure that against sector emissions. I think that happens through the greenhouse gas inventory. And also, I think currently the Department of Public Service does something similar with efficiency response work as well. Um, doing verification after the fact, after they um, installed measures. I'm good for that. Okay, thank you. Up page eight, is that right? Yes. The commission may temporarily adjust the annual requirements for good cause after notice and opportunity for public process. Good cause may include a shortage of clean heat credits or undue adverse financial impacts on particular customers or demographic segments. Um, thank you. Uh, wondering if there is any other precedent in the statute generally about like putting boundaries around temporarily. So um, this has come up before. So temporarily in this case is not defined. However, practically speaking, it is probably going to be, uh, it is probably going to be, the unit of measurement would be a year. It probably cannot be less than that. Right. Yes, that's fair. By year, by eating seasons. Well, no, because the credit amounts are only um, set for an annual period. And so they're due at a specific time at the end of the year. So one might ask the question, uh, are you gonna do the end of the year in the middle of winter or are you gonna end it in the middle of the summer when the more you draw the line it has less effect than it might have if you has, has less of a uh, margin up and down. So I think that's a, I think that's a different question, but the bill does establish that this is on a calendar year, so it does end on uh, December first of each December thirty first of each year. I, I were writing something to a statute to deal with air conditioners. I I would pick that date if I was picking a date to measure E. I pick a date in the middle of the summertime. I don't know what, what date the committee might pick. So do you want to, did, so yeah, did you, so did, that, did I answer your question? Yeah, I'm wondering if we should put, I, I would be more comfortable with this if we put some kind of expectation around that you know no longer than a year and a half like just to uh, give a, a, a ballpark idea of what temporarily means so that PC could just like unilaterally just be like we're just gonna not do it temporarily there was an earlier version that had something like you know for a short period or something like that yeah. and the you know the struggle I had for the phrase like that is well, what is short yeah you know and, so it's a brief. It's like, okay, well, what is brief? You know, it's like, so we're, what is temporarily? So I, I understand the sort of anxiety over like, well, what are we giving away? 
and, and then also for parties affected by things, well, what can they count on and for how long? So, so just from a practical perspective, on the prior page, I there's that language that requires them to update every three years the requirements based on the emissions uh, actually achieved so that they're staying on track with the pace for 2030 and 2050. So while it isn't defined, it seems like they will be constantly or regularly scheduled um, updates will be happening. So it's, I, it's not like they could do a three month adjustment, right? Yeah. Or, so I, I'm just having a hard time because it's going to be on a year cycle. Yep. And so beginning when in the during the year. December 31st is the end of the year. So January 1 to December 31st. Well, so tell are, are you thinking about like what's the shortest yeah. possible? I'm I'm worried about the longest possible. Right. And so putting in some boundary that it, you know, that temporarily will not be more than it. Should be not to exceed whatever. Is so the upper limit. The upper and, limit. So, yeah. And what what works so that it actually right. gets into a cycle yeah. and you don't sort of throw a wrench into the works. Right. Like, I want it to be long enough that if they need to make an adjustment, they have enough time. But not in the middle. Does that make sense? I mean, one phrase I might think about is maybe this helps, maybe it doesn't. Uh, it might be not to exceed a year for in that whole Yeah. So let's <clears throat> you, you, you can, sure you can you can add any language there you prefer. <laughs> okay. So let's flag it to come back. I also had um, language I'd like to consider around that same sub four. And um, and that is to just uh, reaffirm that even if there's a temporary adjustment that the uh, the original goals are still fine. So the language I have about this I don't have enough on my own suggestion about having language in front of everyone. So I'll just read it and then we can see it in writing next time um, if people agree that we can include it. And that is the commission shall ensure that any downward adjustment does not materially affect the state's ability to comply with the requirements of the ESA uh, should be a five five seventy eight B and C or yeah, A2 and 3. A2 and 3. Because we don't have one as part of them. So I'll just read it again. The Commission shall ensure that any downward adjustment does not materially affect the state's ability to comply with the requirements of if you ever said. So if they temporarily reduce, we, the, the notion is that it's not a permanent setback that the Commission should. Um, what that reduction is over. I'm trying to sort of pick the, up the pace again to meet the target. So I don't know if people find that uh, friendly, a friendly amendment or not. Okay. So if you could, I can provide that language to you for next time. If you could have that and highlight it, we'll see it in the next draft. Thank you. Do you want to propose language for temporarily? Um, uh, if I may, yep. I would I would suggest not to exceed a year and a half. Okay, um, just to give a little bit of a buffer. Sure. Okay. So we got a few. What would we be measuring in here? Okay. What would we be measuring? Um, what would we be measuring? Oh, uh, by with temporarily language or with Senator Grace extra language? I'm still on the point. If you're going to measure over three years, when do you start the year? And we've heard the uh, calendar year. Um, we do income tax on the 
calendar year, we do school taxing on the, the school year. And we don't do them differently to confuse people. Um, we do them differently because the measurement lends itself. It makes more sense and has more clarity for different measures. So, when does it, I'm going to ask the question loudly when do degree days get measured? For a heating Anybody season. in the corner somewhere? I think it's for a heating season. Um, if if I may, it probably because we're going to be getting this information potentially from the tax department. I think it makes more well. We'll get information from the tax department. It probably makes sense to align it with the tax cycle. So are we measuring income and taxes. Or are we measuring temperatures and heat savings? So can I jump? Yeah. There's the program design is calendar year. Okay. You could say, well, it should be calendar year, period. Like it should be uh, a June, a July 1 calendar or something like that. But the proposal from the, in the bill originally and from the PUC since was to do an annual uh, true up and it uses the calendar. It is retrospective, so it's not. It, when you're creating the obligation, you're looking back at sales for the prior year. That's a calendar. Uh, very disappointing with the committee picks having looked at the various whatevers. I will go on this. Based on, if I may, yeah, um, based on, on this form that um, those of you who are selected feel have to fill out, um, there's a spot for quarterly file, filers or monthly filers. So there is, um, you have to report for the first quarter, which starts January. Right. So the, I understand your question. It's like, is the, is the cycle of analysis fit <clears throat> the activity that we're engaged in? Well, that should be the unit of the measure. Does it fit the activity we're engaged in? Thank you for your okay. patience. <clears throat> so we have the year and a half piece. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, set, yes. Setting the time frame is a policy choice. The House last year in H seven fifteen considered different dates other than calendar year, uh, but past the calendar year, which is, and I I don't think we have had much discussion on it during S five, but this was based on what happened in last year's bill. So this is a policy choice that you could make. You could keep it or change it. So uh, it could be that you would still have this quarterly option, but you would be shifted two quarters towards. So I think one thing I'd be interested in hearing from is since the, the PUC will be administering, well, I would, would not want to make the change without there could be reasons that they would prefer one or the other. You know, real world administrative consequences that we're unaware of. So I think it's a good question. Does the does this, the definition of a year fit in with um, the nature of the activity that we're monitoring? And in this case, it's uh, yes. You know, you might say we're looking at heating season after heating season. So let's flag it as a good question, talk to the PC, think about it on our own, and uh, look at revising how to extract if we need to or want to. Thank you, Senator McCown. Page eight, line five, annual registration. Each entity that sells heating fuel into or in Vermont shall register annually in, uh, with the commission by an annual deadline established by the commission. The first registration deadline is, ja is January 31st, 2024, and the annual deadline shall remain January 31st of each year unless a different deadline is established by the commission. The form and information required in the registration shall be determined by the commission and shall include all data necessary to establish annual requirements under this chapter. 
The commission shall use the information provided in the registration to determine whether the entity shall be considered an obligated party and the amount of its annual requirement. At a minimum, the commission shall require registration information to include legal name, doing business as name if applicable, municipality, state, types of heating fuels sold, and the volume of sales of heating fuels into or in the state for final sale or consumption in the state in the calendar year immediately preceding the calendar year in which the entity is registering with the commission. Page nine, the Department of Taxes shall annually provide a list of entities that pay the fuel tax pursuant to 33 BSA 2503A1 and 2 to the commission. Sorry, Mr. Um, just flagging the same, um, sorry, this is back on page eight, line one, uh, line six, um, just that we have the same um, definition question about those selling fuel into or in Vermont. Where is maybe we're actually, this is different. It's different. It is. Never mind. I yeah. absent my comments. I'm good to go. Great. So how it's phrased there is that they want everyone to register um, so that they know the universe of entities. And they may or may not be obligated for right. it. Right. I'm with you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. But I think yeah, we can go into sort of operational details of why, but Oops. to make sure to help yeah. the, the department, uh, the PUC, I'm sorry, <clears throat> know who all the actors are, whether they're obligated or not. Uh, line three. Each year, not less than 30 days following the annual registration deadline established by the commission, the commission shall share complete registration information of obligated parties with the Agency of Natural Resources and the Department of Public Service for purpose of con purposes of conducting the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast and meeting the requirements of um, 591B3, which is um, the inventory and forecast statute. So more data sharing, yes. ensured data sharing. Yes. The commission shall maintain, oh, sorry, just as a flag, the word conducting feels weird to me there. <laughs> um, perhaps, it'd be, it, perhaps it should be updating the greenhouse gas emissions inventory. That's sort of a, that's on line seven. So conducting the, uh, it does seem odd. So, I like a little update. They already have one, so unless it's it could be conducting analysis for the greenhouse gas inventory. Yeah, we're trying to feed data to them, so yeah. updating. Is okay. Like it's, it's a good choice. Thanks. Okay. Uh, line nine, the commission shall maintain and update annually a list of registered entities on its website that contains the required registration information, except that the public list shall not include heating fuel volumes reported. For any entity not registered on or before January 31st, 2024, the first registration form shall be due 30 days after the first sale of heating fuel to a location in Vermont. Clean heat requirements shall transfer to entities that acquire an obligated party. Uh, can I, uh, catching up a little here, uh, 1112, the public list shall not include heating volumes recorded. Just want to flag that for consideration because I know what the PUC they were talking about, that information they receive is the public. And so I don't want to, I don't want to, I just want to make sure that that squares with their, their thing because EPUC does not information that goes in there, it's all public. So I just want to check in with them that we're not saying something that's inconsistent with their ability to manage data. Okay, Senator Watson. Uh, this feels like the section that might be good to include something like, because seven is about the transfer of 
requirements, and then eight is about operated by entities that cease to operate. So um, it feels like a place to address uh, new entities. Um, should a new entity start up, mm -hmm. um, how would we deal with that? Um, um, I thought they were captured by number six. Okay. So um, it's, no, not, right. it's not detailed, um, but it's any, so it could, that would, language would cover a newly formed business or a business who's doing business for Vermont in the first time, for the first time. Okay. But if you'd like to be more, no six, especially you could. That satisfies it for me. Thank you very much. Um, and so on line 18, as Senator Washington just mentioned, um, entities that cease to operate shall retain their clean heat requirement for their final year of operation. Early action credits. Beginning on January 1, 2023, clean heat measures that are installed and provide emission reduction are creditable and shall count towards the future clean heat credit requirements of an obligated party. Upon the establishment of the the currently uh, heat delivery companies are buying out smaller or other is that transition covered in here? So there's an attempt to cover it um, in seven and eight. Um, and so you know eight says even if someone ceases to operate, they retain their their um, requirement, and so they're potentially going to need to pay for any um, you know, deadline or obligation they fail to meet. Um, but then anyone who purchases a company or acquires it in some way is covered by seven. Is they take they on they buy in the obligation? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. The idea traditional is sort of assets acquisition and the liability. The goal was to not let quietly uh, cease operation and drop it and lose its obligation. Um, and someone else could not buy get it. Surprised. Someone else could acquire the company and say, well, that was theirs. That's not, that's not my obligation. Or saying, you know, the obligation lives on whoever picks up that and inherits the obligation as well. well that makes sense. Our, our actual mileage may vary. Um, whoever ways of acquiring yeah, I don't even want to talk about like bankruptcy proceedings and debt. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but well, I'm just, it's a best way ever to address what you're talking about. Uh, page 10, uh, page 10 uh, line 2. Upon the establishment of the clean heat credit system, entities may register credits for actions taken starting in 2023. Subsection D, equitable distribution of clean heat measures. The clean heat standard shall be designed and implemented to enhance social equity by minimizing adverse impacts to customers with low income and moderate income and those households with the highest energy burdens. The design shall ensure all customers have an equitable opportunity to participate in and benefit from Clean heat measures, regardless of heat and fuel used, income level, geographic location, or home ownership status. Just, uh, just a quick note to Senator Watson. So that or home ownership status was the flag around trying to make sure that we're uh, saying allowed or explicitly renters as well as homeowners. Right. And I, I know we need to. We, there's yes. more. More to, more to be talked on there. Yeah. And so just to flag that I I am interested in beefing up some of the protections or supports for particularly renters. To be continued. Senator McCormick? I've gotten some uh, input from constituents uh, with the opinion that that focusing on economic people in economic disadvantage makes sense but may not go far enough there are 
uh, racial, uh, ethnic, and cultural issues that sometimes have an impact exclusive of the economics. And um, I'm wondering if, if nothing else, I wonder if we have we run this by the uh, um, at, at the state equity director. And it's just a day this yeah. Yeah. I don't not, I don't believe we have seen her this year or last. Yeah. So are you suggesting we might have yeah, her to yeah. do that? Okay. Um, there is that there is the what you're talking about, could we improve the language? The uh, open question, line six gets at the social equity. It's just a, a dot on it, but you know, maybe we need to say more about that. So we'll schedule her as a, a witness. I'll make sure we get her a copy of the bill in advance and I'll try to see her at the beginning of next week. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this the, the, the PUC will be able to raise or lower, is that correct? The percentages? It's not that. Uh, uh, no. Just change the percentages. Sure. Well, I know it. Page 11. Um, we're not asking for page 11. Page 11, line 9. Okay, so we're yeah, sorry, you're a little ahead of us. We're back on page of 10. <laughs> and um, no, that's okay. You're, you're out driving us. Uh, we're just not looking at that section 5 through lines 5 through 10 on page 10. Okay, we'll get there. I just caught between the winter and summer. Okay. Of their annual requirement, each obligated party shall retire at least 16% from customers with low income and 16% from customers with moderate income. At least one half of these credits shall be from installed clean heat measures that require capital investments in homes, have measure lives of 10 years or more, and are estimated by the technical advisory group to lower annual energy bills. If, so I'd like to propose an edit for this section. And there's been some concern that that at least one half of these credits shall be from um, could get um, that you might do it um, all in the low income uh, area or all in the high income area. And so the idea was that at least half applied to each of these groups. So I thought maybe a simple edit could be to lead in to that sentence that begins on line 13. For each of these groups, at least one half. And that way people don't have to worry that one group could receive all that bad treatment as the other group could would not. Just to be explicit about the expectation. Or we'll be able to that. So try. So thank you. Um, well, we'll we, so how about if we'll just read it through like one more time sure. that change uh, so with the sense of again slide 13 he currently reads at least one half of these credits uh, we just well I'll start with yeah, yeah, the four sure. because it's each obligated party shall retire at least 16 percent from customers with low income and 16 percent from customers with moderate income for each of these groups, at least one half of these credits shall be from installed clean heat measures, etc. Just to make it explicit that they both get treated that way. So, eight percent and eight percent. Yeah, we could we could you know, do that. But some people worry that by not saying something like for each of these groups that someone would be um, at least one half of these credits shall be from installing measures but that all that could all fall to just one of the or unevenly into this category of low and moderate 
So this is just saying, okay, it's duplicative, but it says for the low and for the moderate groups, one fifth and a half shall be from its tall measures. Now, trying to avoid um, trying to be explicit about that expectation or explicit. Okay. You did you catch that like, for the next graph? I think you're gonna send me language, aren't you? But I did write it down. Okay, I wrote it down too. All right, so on line 16, examples shall include weather station improvements and installation of heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and advanced wood heating systems. The commission may identify additional measures that qualify as installed measures. Upward. Page 11. The definitions of customer with low income and customer with moderate income shall be set by the commission in consultation with the equity advisory group and in alignment with other existing definitions. The commission may consider front loading the credit requirements for customers with low income and moderate income so that the greatest proportion of clean heat measures reach Vermonters with low income and moderate income in the earlier years. Um, sorry. Where are you? Page 11, I, that was subdivision four by four. So I know there's been conversation about leaning harder into this notion of front loading. So, Senator Watson, do you have that? I know you and I chatted about it a little bit. Do you have, you want to just talk about it? Do you have language yet? or? What well, I, I think just flagging it for now would okay. be good. So, um, uh, you know, one of our witnesses suggested that the in four it should say the commission shall consider front loading as of May. Um, and uh, I, I may have some suggestions around how we could potentially front load, but if possible, we can come back to that. I just want to flag it as sure. we might have more language. Right. right. So, is, is that fair for now? Well, yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think, you know, I've had the same question. Right now it's entirely permissive. Um, we might want to, as I was saying, lean into it more by saying shall consider. Mm -hmm. It doesn't obligate them to take a particular action, but it, uh, in terms of how they direct the credits, but it, it obligates them to at least consider how they might do that. Well, I, yes. And I think it's, you know, so the dynamic is I understand underneath the hood here is that the more uh, the more work you do on uh, lower income uh, residences or uh, homes, whatever, apartments, the more expensive they may be. So you might uh, not be able to get the as much work done, but mm -hmm. that's it's a balancing act, and it'd be good to know more about this. Um, if I, if I, I guess because this is not, it's not like a you will front load it, you will consider. I, I guess I would suggest that we make a change from May to Shell, so it's like they have to at least consider it. So they shall make. Yeah. We're we're it. We're asking the PUC to do a bunch of stuff, which is technical, which is designing systems to achieve certain goals. But the, the, these three sentences here, we're asking them to deal with policy of, uh, of who, who is favored and who is not favored. And that's our job. Um, we uh, are front loading or not front loading, front loading that's policy. And so we decide whether we're going to pay for it or not pay for it, or it shall be paid for or not be paid for. That's um, policy decisions. <clears throat> you know, if it should be front loaded, then we should say so. If not, delegate to the public utility commission to decide whether you know, how this group of citizens should be or should be treated. We deal with people and their incomes. They deal with definitions of fuel and systems that are fair. Uh, Senator White. Um, just want to say I appreciate that 
point. And so I can picture just replacing for with language that specified how we might have love. Because um, I, I appreciate that, like, we should be writing that policy. Or how it might be or how it shall be. Right. Yeah, that, that that's yeah. our policy. Yeah, I like I like that idea. So for you mean like a for instance for me to schedule. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so one thought is I agree I'm agreeing with both of you and I'm also sort of thinking about the implications. Uh, it would be helpful I we're in a position of speculating what the impacts would be, and so I'm just wondering about: Do we want information back from the PC during the development process about the implications of front loading or not? And uh, we might, with more data, we might make a change. We might spell out a schedule very explicitly, or it might say. We might not. So I, I, all I'm saying is I'm feeling like, yes, I want to lean into this provision. And secondly, I don't know enough about the implications of specifying to what degree we provide more benefits to any particular group in the early years. And what do we mean by early years? Is it years one through five? I'm not sure. Well, I, I feel comfortable just leave, like putting an asterisk by it and coming back to it. Okay. Sports options. Um, so center white gets there, but McCormick. I'm about to ask counsel. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> what? You did say you got to go second. I said center white and center McCormick. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I didn't hear that. Oh, no. I didn't ignore it. Go forward ahead. No. See, your center from I, winds I, are always. I simply did. I know exactly. So my my question was, thank you, Chair Bray. Um, well, it was more of a comment than a question, uh, which is when we've had the PUC, and one of the things I heard loud and clear was flexibility, and I feel like we are trying to strike a balance between giving them flexibility to create a program while not being overly prescriptive and also setting firm guidance on what we want. So I'm, my comment is I'm hesitant to be more prescriptive in the bill than flexible because I do think that we've got a very robust process that if for some reason they're trying to finagle with this and not put out our intent of supporting low and moderate income folks first, then we have very clear ways that we can address that through the rulemaking process. And I also am very understanding that we are asking the PUC to do something extremely innovative and new. And there's going to be wrinkles that come up. Um, and I don't want to have them have a, as tight as the timeline is, a, a more difficult time um, than necessary because we've been so prescriptive. So I lean towards not changing the language, but I also um, am respectful of uh, if that if that gives people comfortable to leave with it. Um, so, yeah. So, McCormick, thank you. Um, and I'm asking the council as a writer of the bill. The legislature establishes policy and delegates to the administrators the job of implementing policy exactly where the line is. I, I, I'm not aware of a particular, like a written standard or something that drafters refer to and look at as to exactly where the legislative prerogative and responsibility ends and administrative discretion begins. Is there some, how do you measure where, how much, how much we can delegate legitimately? So there is, uh, it's not written so much as I guess it was written. The Supreme Court has established precedent under which uh, the legislature makes an improper delegation, whether or not there is sufficient guidance. I'm going to get the word wrong because I don't have it in front of me, but there has to be sufficient guidance 
in the delegation. It can't be vague. Do we perhaps address this question just by making sure we've given sufficient guidance? Do you think we have given sufficient? Yes. Also, so it, sorry. So in that case, vague is very low. <laughs> um, there have to be some guardrails, and this this bill is fairly detailed. Now, are some sections more detailed than others? Sure. Um, but I haven't thought from a legal perspective that there was an improper delegation because there was a lack of um, guardrails. So I think there is sufficient guidance. You can provide more. Um, there are rulemaking delegations in statute currently that just say, for example, under Act 250, it just says the, the Natural Resources Board shall adopt rules to implement Act 250. That's the whole. That's the whole section. That's the whole delegation. Yeah. Yes. That's so, <laughs> courts have looked at it. I'm not as familiar with some of the detailed precedent, but there is there is a fair amount of delegated, um, clear delegation of authority in this bill. Next. Um, along those same lines, uh, sometimes I'm almost horrified by the uh, degree to which we are vague as a legislature. As in that instance, shall adopt rules too, and then that's it. it is, and after that, it's like you have no basis almost for objecting to whatever came back uh, or evaluating the legislative intent. So in this case, I feel like we're we are working very hard to provide a lot of specificity around what they're developing, how, what they're looking at, all that kind of stuff. Um, one, we, well, I think it would probably be helpful to move on, which is we're flagging this as something that we consider. One possibility is, in my mind, it's something like shall assess the impacts of from voting. I mean, they could provide data back to the legislature in their development process that would let us make a policy choice. Um, anyway, but I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. So, um, where are we on this case? Did we get? We any? finished four. Yeah. Okay. So let's pause for fifteen. How about ten minutes? Because it's a one thirty start today at four. So let's just take a pause for ten minutes. Come back at ten twenty.